we're back on the adventure of the Bible. And what's interesting about this series is, I don't know where it's going to take me from week to week. I told you the Lord Jesus Christ is our tour guide, and I'm just going wherever he leads me to go. And he's taking us down different avenues. And we don't know where we're going to end up from week to week. And it's not going to be in a complete chronological order here. I don't know where it's going to take me next week. But uh, last week we began on the spirit world. And we talked about Lucifer. We talked about the cherubs. We talked about how Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covereth. And he fell somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. But the Lord's plan was to have a creation full of sinless beings to worship him. He had different ones of different shapes and sizes. And you had Lucifer, the anointed cherub, and the rest of the cherubim. You had seraphim and you had angels. Now Lucifer sinned and he wanted to exalt his throne above God's throne. And no doubt he took some of the angels with him. So you've got... The devil's angels, and you've got the elect angels. You've got the angels of God which are in heaven. You've got the angels that didn't leave their first estate in Genesis 6. you got the angels that left their first estate. You know, there's different types of angels. The angels aren't cherubim. The angels aren't seraphim. Uh, the devil's not what you'd say a fallen angel, even though we, you know, people say that. He was the anointed cherub. He appears as an angel of light. But just to clear up any confusion you have on angels, let's talk about them. Let's get into a description of the angels and see what we can learn from them. Now, number one, the first thing about angels is they're without number. In Hebrews 12, 22, it says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels innumerable that's kind of like the stars you know god told abraham he said go out there and look up at the stars and tell the stars if they'll be able to number them you know he couldn't number them they're innumerable there's they're like the sand on the seashore you know you couldn't even count them in Matthew 26, 53, it says, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. So twelve legions, you know, that wouldn't be all of them, but if you had 3,000 to 6,000 angels in a legion, what a great number of angels. And in Revelation 5, 11, it says, And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels, round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a lot of angels. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Many angels, beasts and elders there. And this should remind you, you're never alone in the fight. You and God are enough. But it's not just you and God. It's you and God and all the angels. Even when you have no Christians around, you're not alone. You have God and you have his innumerable company of angels. So this means you and God are the majority. God is able to keep record of the innumerable company of angels. I mean, if he can keep record of all the hairs of your head, Matthew 10, 30, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. If he knows the number of every hair on every person's head in the whole world, that's an innumerable amount of hair. And uh, Psalm 147, 4 through 5, it says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. And like I said, that in all things, he might have the preeminence. You know, angels are amazing, but they're not as amazing as the one who created them. His under, the one who created them, his understanding is infinite. And he knows all the angels' names. They're all important to him. And he's, he can count them all. 
Someone said the book of Numbers is the scariest book in the Bible because it shows you how good God is at keeping track of things. And the reason uh, my marriage is so good is because, you know, my wife has a bad memory. You know, she forgets all the times I messed up. And she forgets them really fast. You know, I can tell her the same dad joke over and over, and she never remembers it. And I might get a laugh out of her since she don't remember it. And my memory, not too good. Especially not compared to God Almighty. He remembers everything. And he knows everything. And he can recall everything. And he can tell the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. He can, his uh, way of keeping track of things, n nobody can compare to it. You know, the angels, they're without number. Only Almighty God can keep up with the number of the angels. They're without number. Number two, he witnessed his creation. Now, the angels are held to a high standard. And I believe one of those reasons is because they are witnesses of his creation. They're without number and they're witnesses of his creation. They're witnesses of God himself and his power. And I showed you those verses in Job 38, 4 through 7, where it talks about the sons of God. Now, the sons of God in the Old Testament is a name for angels or an, uh, an angelic type of creatures. It says in Job 38, 4 through 7, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. So God's talking to Job about when he laid the foundations of the earth. This would have been before man because it was before Adam and Ma Adam was the first man. So it was before man. So you're going to see there's some witnesses of this creation. So it couldn't be man since it was before Adam. It says, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You see, that's something me and you didn't get to see. I didn't get to see that. But the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy when God was laying the foundations of the earth. And if humans got to see that, you know, there wouldn't, none of them would have been atheists. The angels just have no excuse for not following God. Now, me and you in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, I've, I've never seen God and I've never seen God create the earth. But the angels have. Since they were before man... The angels walk by both faith and sight. They've seen the Bible play out with their own eyes. They've seen from Genesis to Revelation with their own eyes. Me and you, we've, we walk by faith. We've not seen it. So the angels are he held to a very high standard. They've been around God. They've seen his creation. I mean, there's no angel that's going to say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe God's real. And all they've been in the presence of God. They've seen him. They've seen they've seen him create the whole earth and the universe. Second Corinthians five seventeen says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come new. And what that verse shows us is you may not have seen the physical creation of the world, but you saw how God made you a new creature on the inside. You know, you didn't get to see God lay the foundations of the earth like the angels, but you remember that moment you got saved and you became a new creature and there was something inside of you that wasn't there before. Maybe nobody could see it on the inside, but after you got saved, there was something created in you that wasn't there before. And you, you know what happened to you. You know that there's something different. And you are a witness to God making you a new creature. And Paul, even the Apostle Paul, even compares what happened to you on the inside when you got saved to God saying, let there be light. He compares God um, creating in you a new creature 
to the recreation in Genesis 1. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when you got saved, light moved in and darkness moved out. Just like back there in Genesis 1, when darkness was upon the face of the deep, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. That was like you before you got saved. Inside you were without form and void. Darkness was in there. And then God said, let there be light. That pictures when you got saved. And light moved in. Darkness moved out. And Paul compares that to when you got saved, you see. He compares Genesis 1 to the moment you believed the gospel and you became a new creature. So you never did see God lay the foundations of the earth. But you're a witness of what God did to you on the inside. And I think it's interesting that Paul uses that analogy there. And it kind of makes me believe that obviously Paul was what they call a gapper. You know, he believed that there was a, a gap there between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And that there was a recreative act that happened in Genesis 1. And Genesis 1 is an account of the God's recreation of everything after Lucifer sinned and God had to drown out the original creation before Adam and Eve were even here because you know you see he's he uses that word darkness just like it's used throughout the Bible in a negative sense you know before you were saved you were full of darkness it was a you were a sinner but then he shined in your hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so Paul saw that darkness back there in Genesis 1. He saw it as, he's showing you that it was negative. And God said, let there be light. Just like you, when you got before you got saved, you had darkness in you. That had to do with sin. Just like in Genesis 1, that darkness... It was because of sin, but then God said, let there be light. So for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So he performed something greater than Genesis 1, the creation itself, in you. Because so much had to happen for him to be able to do that. He had to come down and live a sinless life in the flesh and go through all the pain and agony that we go through, even worse, times a million, times infinite, to be able to let the light to shine in you, to make you a new creature. You see, back there in Genesis 1, all he had to do was just say it, and it happened. But to make the light shine out of darkness in you he had to come down as a man and die on the cross for your sins. So he performed something greater in you than Genesis 1, the creation itself, and he's done that millions of times over. So in that, you are also a witness of his creating power. You didn't see God lay the foundations of the earth, but you think about it, you are a witness of his creating power. Even though you couldn't actually see the operation take place inside, you know that it happened. And it says in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. It says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 4.24, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In that sense, you've seen God's creating power. Now you take it by faith, but in a sense, you've seen it. And in Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they're without excuse. You see, even we are without excuse because even though we didn't see the creation of the world, we can look around and obviously see there had to be a creator. 
And you think about the angels? That has to be one of the reasons why fallen angels can't get saved. They not only see the creation, but they saw it being created. So they are doubly without excuse. You see, God has given you the opportunity to see him create. And to whom much is given, much is required. And you think about a scientist or someone like that who studies the planets, the human body, and knows way more details about all that stuff. And their IQs are far past my IQ. My brain is teeny tiny compared to these scientists and these smart people out there. There are some super smart people in this world that uh, we couldn't even comprehend how smart they are. And yet to God, they're like less than an ant. But they're, they're way smarter than us, and they, they know all about the human body, how it works. I don't know how the human body works. I don't know much about what's in my body at all. I don't know much about planets. I've never studied planets. I've never studied the human body. I don't even know if I could name all the planets off the top of my head. I, I don't know nothing about no new planets. I don't know nothing about the stars. But there's people out there that do. And there's people that know all about DNA. There's people that know all kinds of stuff about everything. But yet, here's the thing. And they still deny God. You know, I don't know much about nothing. And I'm easily believing by faith that God is real. And that God made all this stuff. And I don't even know the details about the human body and DNA. And I'm still believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They know how amazing the planets and the stars and the human body and the D DNA is. They know how amazing it is even more than I do, yet they still not God. You know what that makes them? The more that they learn about that stuff that God made and they continue to deny God, they're getting more and more without excuse. And they're getting further and further away from God. How can you deny God when you know the truth of all that stuff? And you think about an angel. How can he deny God? How can he just say, I don't want God as my God, when he saw God face to face and he saw God's creative power? So angels are, they are without number. They witnessed his creation, and they are without excuse. And the next thing, they are worshipers of God. In Hebrews 1, 4, it says, the Lord is so much better than the angels. So remember, you got to give him the preeminence. Hebrews 1, 6 says, and let all the angels of God worship him. You know, we're not going to worship angels. We're going to worship the one who made the angels. And any good angel is a worshiper of God, just like any good Christian is a worshiper of God. And if an angel worships God, then you need to worship God. Because you see, the angels are much stronger than you, and they worship Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter 2.11, it says, Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. In Psalm 103.20, it says, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength. They excel in strength. They're much stronger than us. Yet they bless the Lord. Even though they are stronger than us, Paul warns against the worshiping angels. They don't deserve any worship. In uh, Colossians 2.18, it says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. You see, God's angels are good and holy, but they don't deserve your worship. A good angel would always decline your worship. In Revelation 22, 8 and 9, it, it says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So, he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, and the angel said, worship God. Any good angel will direct you back.
to worshiping God and not Him. You know, some people, they really like being admired. You know, some people like that. But if you're doing anything for the right reason, you're not going to want to be admired. You will point back to the Lord. You're going to point back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I imagine the angels look at that and think, you know, when they look and see a guy that loves to be admired and he's accepting all this worship, kind of like Herod in the book of Acts, he didn't give God the glory and, you know, he just felt he, God killed him and he got eight of worms, you know, a guy like that. Or a guy like Diotrephes, who loveth the preeminence, doesn't want to give the Lord the preeminent place. You know, I imagine the angels look at a man that's full of himself and loves being admired like these celebrities and celebrity preachers and TV preachers. I imagine the angels look at them and think, who does this guy think he is? You know, they probably think, you know, we're a lot flashier. We're a lot stronger. We're much holier than this guy and we worship God. So why does this man, this little man down here, want everybody to worship him? You know, a good Christian would decline your worship. Just like a good angel would decline your worship. A good angel would decline your praise and glorying in him and will always direct you back to God because it's the Lord that does the good through you. Any good thing that you do, you got to give credit to the Lord and all the bad things you do, you give credit to yourself. You know, when someone has given you the preeminence, remind them that it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ, our tour guide. Remember, he's our tour guide. He's the one that shows us everything. And if he didn't show us stuff, we wouldn't have any idea. It's all a blur until he fixes our eyes and lets us see it. In Psalm 148, 1 through 2, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. The angels of God worship him. 1 Peter 3.22 says, Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. All the angels, all the authorities in the spirit world are subject unto him. A good angel worships God. So the angels, they are without number. The angels are worshipers of God. The angels witnessed his creation, so they're without excuse. The next thing, angels walk like a man. You think about an angel, he walks like a man. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, they are called man. They're called young men or young men. There's not sexless angels. There's not female angels. I don't believe the spirits in Zechariah 5 are angels. And that would be the only female ones that showed up if those were angels. So angels walk like a man. In Genesis 19, 1, you know the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. But in Genesis 19, 1, there came two angels. You know, think about those two angels. You know, they're not named. But no telling how many missions these two angels have been sent on since this happened. And right now, these two angels are walking around somewhere. Most likely, sometime out in eternity, you'll be able to walk up to them and talk to them. But there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and worship, and wash your feet, and ye shall... Rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide, abide in the street all night. So imagine. Imagine for me this story in your mind. Imagine the tour guide, your Lord Jesus Christ, is taking you by the hand, walking you through the Bible, and he brings you to Genesis 19. And you imagine these two angels are in Sodom, and they're going to go in Lot's house. But angels are rough enough and confident enough to hang out in the streets of Sodom all night long. And, and you know, Sodom is, is, is a dangerous place. Sodom is the place that the Lord uses as an example of a wicked place throughout the Bible. 
And yet these angels were just said, no, we'll just hang out in the street all night. You know, they walk like men. They're not afraid. They know that they got God and they know that, you know, God's got them on this mission and there's nothing anybody can do to stop them. And in Genesis 19, 3, it says, and he, and talking about Lot, and he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. So angels can take on physical reality and eat physical food. And you know the manna that that uh, Israel ate in the wilderness is actually angels' food. So angels do eat, and I don't believe it's to stay alive. I believe it's just for the pleasure of it and for fellowship of it. In Psalm 78, 24 through 25, it says, And rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. So, you think about that. Angels eat physical food. And angels, a good angel was okay with God sharing some of their food with his people. And they didn't get jealous if they were a good one. And Genesis 19, 4, But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Now notice that. The Sodomites were old and young. And that's what they want in this country. They want your kid to be sex perverts as well. That way they can do what they please with them. And they'll be all right with it, you see. See how they're grooming all the children to be like them. And if they groom them to be like them at a young age, when those kids get older, they'll be even worse off than them. And it'll just keep getting worse and worse and worse with what they'll accept. But Sodom, it's a wicked place where these angels are. But now here's the key. This is why I brought you to Genesis 19, Genesis 19, 5. And the men of the city are talking, the men of the city are talking, and they called unto Lot, you see, and said unto him, Where are the men? Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. They said that we may know them. And they didn't just want to know how they was doing. They didn't just want to know their name, where they worked, or who their parents were. They wanted to know know them, know them. You see, the Bible is written in such a way that you can, uh, you can get what is going on, but if a kid is present, they won't get it. You see? You, you know what was going on here. They wanted to really get to know them. So these homosexual men, they saw the two angels and they wanted to know them because obviously they are attracted to men being sodomites. So this shows you that angels in the Bible are men. They walk like a man. In Revelation twenty one seventeen, it says, And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty four cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And in Hebrews 13, 2, it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You know, you can't entertain angels unawares if they had wings and halos. You can't entertain angels unawares if they're sexless. You know, you, you see this being coming up to you with the wings and halos, and he's sexless. It's not a man or a woman, and you... You know, you're going to be like, well, this is an angel. You see, you wouldn't be able to entertain it unawares. You're going to know, well, this is an angel. Now, maybe in 2024, if something came up to you with wings and a halo and you couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, you might think, well, this is just one of them crazies. But, you know, up until the recent years, you know, you uh, you would know, well, this is an angel. If, if they had wings and halos and were sexless, you couldn't tell what sex they were. But you see, you can entertain angels unawares because uh, angels in the Bible look just like men. They don't look like cherubim. They're different. Cherubim have four wings, four faces. The sole of their feet's like the sole of a calf's foot. Angels don't look like seraphim of Isaiah 6. They've, seraphim's got six wings, 
And angels don't have wings. But now, the next thing. Angels work in both worlds. You already saw how they came down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And they took on physical reality and ate food. They drank water. They got their feet washed. And they smote the men of Sodom with blindness. So we know they can work in the physical world. But they can also work in the spiritual world. Since angels are spirits. They're not bound to either one. They can be in the physical. They can be in the spiritual. They work in both worlds. In Hebrews 1, 7, it says, and, the angel, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. So angels are spirits. They can work in the physical world. They can work in the spirit world. Here are some verses that show you them working behind the scenes in the spirit world. You've seen them work in the physical. Now I'm going to show you the spiritual. You know, you got in Luke 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus died and he went to paradise, the comfort side. The rich man died and he went to the torment side. And look, the angels played a part in this. In Luke 16, 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So the angels took the soul of Lazarus and carried it down there to the comfort side. And I'm guessing they would have took the rich man and carried him to the torment side. So you see, they work behind the scenes in the spirit world. It says in Daniel 10, 12 through 13, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remain there with the kings of Persia. So you see, the kingdoms have a spirit behind them. Just like Michael the archangel is one of the chief princes. He is chief prince for Israel. And what happened was, Daniel sent up a prayer. And his words were heard. And an angel was coming for his words. But this other spirit held him up 21 days. And Michael had to come and help him. So this shows you a spiritual war going on in the spirit world that we can't even see. And the angels are busy working in that spirit world. And, you know, this, this uh, scenario here is not like this today. When you send up a prayer, you don't got to wait for somebody to come for your words. It always Go straight into the throne room. Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But you see the example of angels working two jobs. The angels work both worlds. They work two jobs, spiritual and physical. The king of Syria sent his men with horses and chariots against Elisha. And look what happens in 2 Kings six fifteen through 17. It says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. So you see, there's a huge spirit world out there all around you with angels at work. They work in both worlds. And they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Like I said earlier, you're not alone. Even when you think you're alone, you're not alone. And you know the famous Jacob's ladder story, Genesis 28, 12, talking about Jacob and he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. 
And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So they can go back and forth faster than the speed of light. They're not bound to the earth like the fallen angels. The angels can work both worlds. They're not bound to physical. They're not bound to spiritual. And the angels know what time it is. So they work. Even the devil, the anointed cherub himself, in Revelation 12, 12, it says he knoweth he hath but a short time. And if he's going to know that he has a short time then, I imagine he's conscious of, conscious of time now. So the spirit world works in both worlds, and we should work in both worlds. And you know, most men today won't even work in the physical world, let alone the spiritual world. But 2 Thessalonians 3.11 says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. I imagine the angels are looking at you and they're like, seeing you lay on a couch like a lazy slob, and they're, if angels could throw up, they'd probably throw up all over you. And you'd have spiritual vomit all over you. But in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, it says, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands. As we commanded you, work with your own hands. Don't expect somebody to get up and do the work for you. You got all these slobs that are like leeches. And if you allow them to, they will leech onto you. They'll let you go to work. They'll let you pay their bills. They'll let you take care of their kids. They'll let you suffer while they lay in bed till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock every day. And you're about to get home and they're still in bed. And yet, but you're just supposed to take care of them and coddle them because they've, uh, they've been on drugs for 20 years. And, you know, they've got these problems. They're sick in their mind or whatnot. People make excuses for them. So, so well, they've, they can't help it. No, they can't help it. People knew drugs was bad when they get on them, and when you get on drugs, you reap the consequences of the drugs. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. When you are a lazy slob, and you know it's wrong to be a lazy slob, and you're a lazy slob for 20 years, you become incapable of moving. And so we're supposed to cater to you and let you suck the blood out of our bodies because you're lazy and a drug addict that won't get up off your carcass and try to better yourself. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 4.11, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands. Quit relying on everybody else to do your job and working for you and keeping you up. And then while they're working for you and keeping you up, you're envying them because they got something that you don't have. And in 1 Timothy 5, 8, it says, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If you are such a lazy, no good thing, that you won't even work to provide for your own family, and you got all these other people that's having to take care of your kid, you're worse than an infidel. It's like you don't even believe you know, every day I go to work with lost people who got the decency to at least get up out of bed and go to work. And here you are, you're claiming to be a Christian and you won't even work. I imagine the angels are like looking at you like, man, this, this is pathetic. You know, the spirit world sees it. The physical world sees it. You're going around claiming to be a Christian and you won't even lift a finger to work in this physical world, let alone the spirit world. It says in Romans 13, 11, and that, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. You need to wake out of sleep. You know, drowsiness, so clothe a man with rags. Each day you wake up, there is more grains of sand in the bottom of your hourglass than there was the previous day. You're just allowing time to pass by. You're wasting your life. Each day you wake up, there's more grains of sand at the bottom of your hourglass. Think about that. And each grain of sand is special and a gift. What are you doing for the Lord today? Think about it. If a person is 60 right now, 
if you're listening to this and you're 60 and the average person lives to be 70, they just have about 520 weeks left. That's it. And some men think deep down that they got plenty of time. You know, the spirit world knows they've got but a short time. So they're working in both worlds. You know, I have about 520 more weeks left before my daughter is an adult. She's only eight now. But before she's an adult, I got 520 more weeks. So I've got, I've only got 520 more weeks to train her up. You know, today is as good of a day to get to work as any other day. I need to get to work now. You know, some people I've worked with, they get more hours of sleep at work than I do at night. Think about that. They, get, they sleep more at work than I do at nighttime. You'll have new hires, n- new guys that miss more days in two months than I've missed in my entire ice cream stacking career. I mean, they're scheduling a day off every week, basically. You know, some people at the very sight or even mention of work, they get this overwhelming look on their face of dread and fear. You would think they were facing Goliath and Og, King of Bashan or something when they go to work. So we need to work in the physical, but also the spiritual. I hope you work in the physical, but there's a lot of people that work in the physical, but they won't lay a finger on the spiritual. When it comes to the spiritual world, they're like those lazy slobs that lay on the couch and leech on people and suck their blood out until they ain't got none left when it comes to the spiritual. They may work in the physical, but that's all that they do. They're good, decent people. When it comes to this physical world, when it comes to the spiritual world, they're lazy. It says in Ephesians six twelve, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness. You know, anytime you turn down temptations from the devil or unclean spirits, that's working. It's fighting, and that's spiritual war. Anytime you preach the gospel to lost people, that's working in the spirit world, and you're setting up treasures in the spirit world. And most people, if they work at all, they're heaping up treasures for the physical world only. And in Matthew 6.20, it says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. You know, when you do spiritual work, you lay up spiritual treasures. And since providing for your family through physical work is of God, that will also get you spiritual treasures. If you're doing it right, you're doing it with the right motive. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of this world. They're not physical. They're spiritual weapons. My weapons aren't of this world. They're spiritual The word of God is my sword. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Our fight is a spiritual fight. King David's fight was more physical. He had a real visible physical sword. It was still spiritual, but it was a lot more physical than ours. Ours is more spiritual than physical. But the angels, they work in both worlds. Me and you, we need to work in both worlds. Now, the next thing, angels are watching you. They're watching you. In Daniel 4.17, it calls them watchers. And in 1 Corinthians 4.9, it says, For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Just when you think nobody can see you, the spirit world sees you. We are a spectacle to angels. The angels are studying you. Think about that. Just like we, me and you are studying the angels right now, they're studying us. I imagine they are as intrigued by you as you are by them. In 1 Corinthians 11, 9 through 10, it says, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. They're present and watching. 
A woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels. They're watching her. It says in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us that administer the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into they're they're looking into it they desire to look into the angels see you when you think nobody is watching in ecclesiastes 5 6 it says suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin neither say thou before the angel that it was an error wherefore should god be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands even if nobody is around god is there the angels are there. What are you saying before the angel? You know, the devil may hear it. Unclean spirits may hear it. You know, that with half wings shall tell the matter. The unclean spirits that are pictured by unclean birds. You know, that's where you get the saying, a little bird told me that you think you're saying it. You think you're saying it nobody's around. Well, the unclean spirits hear it. And that with hath, which hath wings shall tell the matter. You just thought you were committing adultery and nobody knew it. You just thought you were watching pornography and nobody knew about it. But the angels are watching you. They see you. And now the last thing, or actually not the last thing, angels are wise beings. In 2 Samuel fourteen twenty, it says, according to the wisdom of an angel of God. You see? according to the wisdom of an angel. You see, the devil was the anointed cherub, and it said in Ezekiel 28, 3, that he's wiser than Daniel. And Daniel was a really wise man. In Proverbs 4, 7, it says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, with all thy, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. You know, angels have wisdom. We need to get wisdom. And you can get it through the Scriptures. You get it by hanging around God. I imagine the angels got wiser from hanging around God. The next thing, angels have wingless flight. They got wingless flight. Even though they don't have wings, they can still fly. And Daniel 9.21, it says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly. Touch me about the time of the evening oblation. In Revelation 8, 13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. Wingless flight. You think the angels get to do all this cool stuff and get to see the Bible played out before their eyes, and you think how cool that is? But one day, me and you will be caused to fly swiftly without wings at the rapture, and we'll meet the Lord in the air according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18. You will be in a glorified body, so you won't be afraid to fly. You're not going to be worried about heights anymore after that in your glorified body. Now, angels are also wearers of white. They wear white. In Matthew 28, 2 through 5, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and set upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. In John 20, 11 through 12, it says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Two angels sitting in white. So they're wearers of white. Now the last thing. Angels want you to get saved. In Luke 15, 10 it says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. The angels want you to get saved. A good angel. A good angel is an envious of your salvation they want you to get saved in ephesians 1 7 it says in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace in colossians 1 14 it says in whom we have redemption 
through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. The only way for you to get saved is to get the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to you. And the way to do that is call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you owe a debt you can't pay. So God came down in the flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And he lived a sinless life. And when he died on the cross, he wrote a check for you in his blood. Now, every man who ever lived is offered this check written in blood. And the moment you take it, your sins are paid for and gone. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him, the Lord Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, Jesus Christ, he lived a sinless life, never sinned one time. And it says in Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me and you. I'm ungodly. You're ungodly. Jesus Christ is godly. And the godly man died for you. It says in Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. How do you get saved? Well, you know you're a sinner. You know you're ungodly. And you know Jesus Christ shed his blood. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. And he, when he did that, he paid for your sin. He wrote the check in his blood. Now he's, he's got the check handed it out to you. All you got to do is reach up and take it. Well, how do I take it? Well, the night I got saved, I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was going to hell. And I said, Lord, please save me. I know you died on the cross for me. I know you were buried and resurrected. And I'm going to rely on what you did for me on the cross to save me and get me to heaven. Please, Lord, save me. I accepted the payment. From that point on, I've been saved. So let me ask you, are you saved? Are you going to be with the elect angels in eternity or are you going to be with the angels that left their first estate and the devil's angels in eternity are you going to be with the lord jesus christ for all eternity or are you going to be with the has to be in the lucifer the old anointed cherub that used to cover used to cover us are you going to be with the former god of this world are you going to be with the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, for all eternity? I want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, the innumerable company of elect angels, and the innumerable company of saints. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved.